שפת אל תפתח, ופי יגיד תהילתך. Eternal God, open my lips, and the mouth shall declare your praises. Shabbat Shalom. So we're getting back into Hebrews. And just a quick re- recap first. Um, from the beginning, we have a contest. We have a people who had worshipped in a temple system for all their lives. And many other Jewish people in that system are telling them that they're, fo- that they're following a false messiah. They have been persecuted in the past by their own people, this book tells us, their own families, and the Romans. And now they're being persecuted again, the book tells us. And some were ready to fall. The author of this book reminds them that this is as great, uh, that as great as that oldest system, that temple system was, and as great as the messages in the past were that they had gotten, now they had an even greater message, the greatest message of all from God. So remember, this is not a case of good versus bad. It wasn't, uh, you know, the old messages were bad. This message is about something much better. And it was brought by the greatest messenger of all. The Torah is great and glorious, the scripture says. And now in the new covenant, the Messiah writes the Torah on our hearts and in our minds. For example, is one of the things that's better. It's not that it's done away with. It's that the Messiah, God himself writes it on your heart and in your mind. Ezekiel tells us he fills us with a spirit so that we can follow it, so that we will follow it. The author says of Hebrews that we must pay attention and obey that new messenger so that we will not drift away. In other words, he says that they might drift away if they don't obey that messenger. His purpose is to encourage them to hang on. He feels the need to do so because without encouragement, they might not hang on. They might be lost. I hope that makes sense. The, those words in the Greek there, so that they have a meaning, they have a purpose. In Hebrews 2, 6 to 8, he goes on, quoting Psalm 8, 5 to 7, or 4 to 6 in the Christian numbering system, where the psalmist asks God, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man, one of the, one of the titles of Messiah, that you visit him for the purpose of saving him. We stand in awe that the creator of the universe would go to such extreme lengths to save us. Save us. What are we? We stand in awe of his great love. How many people do you know that would die for you? No one. I'm including family members. We also see that Though the Messiah was made a little lower than angels, when his mission was complete, he was crowned with glory and honor, and everything, everything was put in subjection under his feet. There is nothing that can come against you that is greater than him in any way. Your king is the king, and nothing is beyond him. Then we got bogged down in issues of Christology regarding how the Messiah emptied himself and what that means. So I put a message on the website to go deeper, help clarify the issue, and allow us to continue on. Verse 10, chapter 2, what the author says about the Messiah. Let me pop it up for you. For in bringing many sons to glory, it was only fitting that God, the creator and preserver of everything, should bring the imitator, I'm sorry, bring the initiator of their deliverance to the goal through sufferings. Okay? Why? 
Why is that fitting? Why did the Messiah need to suffer? It's an open forum, discussion. I'm actually asking you, why? Why is it appropriate? For in bringing many sons to glory, it was only fitting, it says. It was fitting that God, the creator, preserver of everything, should bring the initiator of their deliverance to the goal through sufferings. It was fitting that this happened through sufferings. Why? Anything? Anybody? Uh, Say again? So he could identify with us? I would say the reason why the Messiah had to suffer is because by him being called to be a high priest, he, the high priest has to suffer with you. And originally, well, translations use the word sympathy, but originally sympathy means to suffer with. So no one can identify with a high priest who has not endured the great pain. Right, the high priest can identify with the person coming to him. be tested uh, you see you see like he's being refined or the Messiah himself being refined so it kind of becomes a sign for us it shows us how far he was willing to go Some even have families that wouldn't do that, let alone any friends who would do that. But God would do that. Anything else? Well, paid a higher price. Paid a high price. Why did he have to pay a price? Because of our sin. When mankind sinned, okay, it was rebellion against the king of the universe. When you, if you lived in medieval Europe and you stole an apple from a cart and the king said there's no stealing, what happened to you? You paid a pretty heavy price. If you were rebellion, outright rebellion against the king, you, pray, you paid an ultimate price. When we sin against the creator of the universe in Bereshit in Genesis 1... We were in rebellion against the king of the universe, let alone the king of Austria or somewhere. We deserve death. Because of us, the whole universe groans and travail, longing for deliverance. And only blood atones. The whole sacrificial system is set up so that, right, in, in, in the very beginning, what does God do after, he, after you know, the confession, uh, which had to be coerced out of them, that they sin? What does God do? The first thing he does, what is it? He puts, he puts skins on them. Where did those skins come from? You have to have a dead animal to get a skin. Isn't it interesting? Like, like the, this, the animal had to lose its skin. The animal had to die for them. They are now wearing the skin of that dead animal. They're, they're covered by what that animal did. The Mishkan, the temple system, with all those sacrifices... What were they for? How did they take away your sin? They died. Blood, only blood atones. They died in their place. You know, and most of them are for sins that, um, uh, sins of omission, sins that were done ignorantly. Did you notice that as you read through in Vayikra, if you're reading with us? Nothing, there was no sacrifice sitting there for 
if you sinned on purpose. Did you notice that? Nothing. Until Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur says, at the sacrifice of Yom Kippur, it says, all of your sin, it will cover all of your sin. But there's a difference between covering your sin as covering all sin on Yom Kippur to what happens in the Brih Hadashah, where he takes away your sin. In the Brih Hadashah, the Messiah dies in your place and he takes away all your sin. He doesn't just cover your sins for a year and then have to do it again the next year and have to do it again the next year and have to do it again the next year. And he doesn't have to go in and make sacrifices for himself first. Like the Kohen Hagadol in the Mosaic system. He's a greater high priest in a greater system. A system that Moshe's system was modeled after. Moshe saw a pattern. Why is it fitting? Why did the Messiah have to die? Because it's justice. Justice. What's justice? What is righteousness? Righteousness, doing what's righteous, following God, following his commands, justice, doing it on a societal level. I can... Huh? I can... I can uh, show mercy to someone. I can love some, so a murderer sitting over here so much and do so much for the murderer and never want to offend the murderer. Let the murderer do whatever he wants, including murder you, of course. I can let that murderer do everything because I'm loving that murderer so much. If I'm doing that, am I loving you? No. <laughs> That's no longer justice. There's no justice there. Do you understand? There's no justice there. God is a just God. He's loving and merciful and he's righteous. He's also just. And he judges societies and he judges people because he has to. He has to in order to be just. There will, when you get to the kingdom when the new Jerusalem comes down with its streets of gold and its pearly gates you won't see anybody trying to chip the gold off of the streets because the people who would do something like that won't be there you won't see graffiti painted on the pearly gates or on the foundation stones because the people who would do that won't be there He took our place. What did what we deserved? It was only fitting. Do you see? In bringing many sons to glory, it was only fitting that God, the creator and preserver of everything, should bring the initiator, the initiator of their deliverance to that goal of deliverance, that's the goal, through suffering, because that's what we deserved. That's why it's fitting, because it's what we deserved. Notice, and this strikes at the Christological issue again, as the Son of God described in the first chapter, Yeshua was much higher than angels, but he was made lower than angels for a purpose, so that he might, so that, so that. Why was he made lower than angels? So that. Everyone say, so that so that he might taste death. As Stern puts it, experiencing evil and pain for all humility. Something angels cannot do. And that's the point. If he wasn't lower than them, he couldn't have done that.
2.11, For both Yeshua, who sets people apart for God, and the ones being set apart have a common origin. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Aha! <laughs> Aha! For, F-O-R, can be taken to mean because. It initiates a reason for the thing just talked about. The thing just talked about because or for. You with me? It's fitting for Yeshua to experience the suffering of death because he shares a common origin with us. What does that mean, though? Yeshua shares a common origin with us. What does that mean? What kind of, what kind of uh, common origin do we have with Yeshua? Do we? Is it true? Do we have a common origin with Yeshua? Hmm? He took upon flesh. He took upon flesh. He became part of mankind. But became part of mankind. That's part of the law of redemption. You have to, well, the three laws are firmly correct. You had to be a blood member. You had to be willing. Let me ask you, okay, so let me, let me throw something out here. The seed of, was he the seed of Adam? Or are his origins from of old? <laughs> yes. Yes. His origins are of old, and yet he became a human. Something else about his, his origins, right? That maybe we should bring up. What's the difference? Because we're talking about origins, right? So what is his origin here as a human being? When he became a human being, uh, virgin birth, immaculate conception. Is there a difference? What's the difference? Do you know? Virgin birth. What's a virgin birth? Not, not a trick question. What's a virgin birth? His mother was literally, he was literally born through a virgin. His mother was a virgin. She hadn't had intercourse, correct? So it means virgin birth. What does immaculate conception mean? Perfect conception. Perfect Spirit. Perfect. Anyone else? From God. Born without a sinful nature. Anyone else? Immaculate conception. <laughs> Immaculate conception is the theology that says not only was Yeshua perfect, oh, but also man. sinless. No. No. I'm sorry, that's immaculate conception. No, that's not accurate. That's not biblical. I'm not asking you if it's biblical. Well, that is what that is what immaculate conception means right there. See, how could he get he became a human being. You become a human being, you take on the DNA from your father and the DNA from your mother and they go together. And one of and the mother would have had flawed DNA because she was a human being. And so how do you get around that that Yeshua would have been flawed? Well, you say something like this. Well, Mary was also sinless. Oh, oh James, is that biblical? Is that biblical? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. James says it's not biblical. I wish James had been there when the Catholic theologians uh, came up with this, but he wasn't. So, uh, therefore, we have something called the immaculate, right, conception, not the immaculate reception. That's football. Immaculate conception. <laughs> and they say, Miriam. So let me ask you a question. How, how? There's a flaw here, right? There's a flaw. What's the flaw? Not only is it not biblical, but there's something beyond it. I mean, does it work? Does it even work? How could she be sin? How could she be sinless? 
wouldn't her, how could she be perfect and sinless? Didn't she have parents? Didn't they have, yeah, they could have sacrificed her, but also, didn't she have parents? Yep. Well, what about them then? They, they had all kinds of sin. Didn't they have, they had DNA too, right? So wouldn't she have gotten their sin? How did, how did that work? They must have been sinless too. That's probably the next step. It's coming in a hundred years. They have to say, you know, somebody brings it up. Now that they know there's a problem, they have to fix it. They'll have to say, they were sinless too. Obviously it was a miracle. It was, a, it was obviously a miracle. Yes, obviously a miracle. And I don't mean to mock because all kinds of people do things like this. If you get a little bit of a flaw in your theology, it will lead to another flaw and another flaw and another flaw and another flaw. And another flaw. But you need to know that you don't, you, the people in this room apparently do not believe in the Immaculate Conception. You believe in the virgin birth, which is different. I hope you, maybe you don't. We could talk later if you don't. I said that's it. I never knew, I was not aware of the difference. I thought it was the same thing. A lot of people don't. How did they come up with Mary being sinless when all children get their blood from their father? And I'm dead, I'm dead serious. This has been proven scientifically. You'll have to ask them next time you see them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so listen, uh, as far as DNA goes, I mean, um, every person does have DNA. So did Yeshua have DNA when he was on the earth? You had to, right? Where do you get your DNA from? You get it from your mother and your father, right? So who was his father? Who was his earthly father? He had no earthly father. He had no earthly father. So where did that part of the DNA come from? It was a miracle. It was it was from God, from the Ruach HaKodesh, right? And, uh, but then there was Mary's part of the DNA. Pap comes from the mother, right? So it was, you know, you could say, our, if you say it's our DNA that's flawed, and, it, and our DNA does obviously have flaws, that, so how did that, you know, he had de flawed DNA, but he, was, uh, but he was perfect. Well, how does that work? Let me ask you a question. While you mull that over a little bit, right? Let me ask you a question. When Yeshua was walking through the crowds, and a woman had been bleeding for years, and nothing could heal her, and she reached out and touched his seat seat, according to the Torah, what would have happened to him? He would have been unclean. He would have been unclean. But what did happen because he was the Mashiach, the son of the living God? She was healed. She became clean. She was healed. What happens when something unclean comes in contact with God? What happens when, you know, the snails to make this blue dye had disappeared from the coast for thousands, well, many hundreds of years? thousand and almost thousands of years <laughs> right and they've reappeared the snails we know what snails they were it was written in the Talmud but when they took those snails and they ground it up to get the dye and they started to put the dye together some of you know this and they put that dye together and they started putting it on the cloth and they did it in an atmosphere where nothing could contaminate it sterile environment so nothing could contaminate everything's going to go right you know what I mean because uh, otherwise something could interfere. You got to have the sterile environment, scientific, right? You got to do it right. They put it in the environment. It did everything right. It came out purple, and it stank terribly. Stank horribly. Ah, they couldn't take it. Maybe we made a mistake. Try it again. Ah, oh, ah, oh, it's awful. Got to get out of here. I can't take it anymore. This stuff stinks. Just roll it out of here. This, this has got to be something wrong. The Talmud's wrong or we're getting the wrong snail. Something's going wrong. Devorah, roll those barrels out of here and we'll come back in the morning. James, prop the window open, will you? <laughs> All right? Zakia about Adonai, turn the fan on before we go. So they, so they roll the stuff outside. Got to air the place out. They came back in the morning. The sun had risen. The snail is a is the snail clean or unclean? 
It's unclean. But the dye from the snail the dye from the snail when the light from heaven hit that unclean snail dye it became something holy that could be used for service to God. It had turned blue like heaven and it didn't stink anymore. Her DNA touched God's DNA. What happens? It's not a problem. It's not an issue, is it? If God's involved, if God's there, it's good. It's clean. He was the son of Abraham, the son of David. That's another one of his origins, right? So he not only became human, he became a Jew. And not just any Jew, but he became the heir of David. At common origin, Jewish. Common with who? Who's this book written to? The Jewish believers. He had a common origin with us, it says. Who's he talking? Who's the other talking to? Those Jewish believers. Right? In the most, you know, concise, most uh, understanding of what's being said there. Nevertheless, as a Jew, Yeshua is not ashamed to call his countrymen, who this letter is addressed to, the Hebrews, pros Hebreos, his brothers. At least not those. Does it say all his brothers? All of them are his brothers? Which ones are not his brothers? Is there a clause in there that might refine that a little bit? What's the clause? Is there one? Look, in the, look at the scripture. Tell me. What does it say? <laughs> Did I talk too fast? <laughs> Did I go too far? Who are being set apart. Doesn't it say who are being set apart? Those who are being set apart. What does that mean? What does it mean? Being set apart. Sanctification? Sanctification? Oh, same thing. <laughs> okay. What does sanctified mean? <laughs> hmm? To a purpose. It's like being in the world, not of the world. In what way? Don't follow the sins of the world. Be pure. Set apart from what? From evil. Being made ready. Being purified. Set apart for a purpose. Set aside from something. Question. Can you see evidence of sanctification in the life of a person? Because if you repent from your wicked ways, if you do Hebrew is teshuva, then your lifestyle, lifestyle changes. If you've really repented, otherwise you haven't repented, right? You haven't changed. No one, you don't see much talk about repentance these days. Have you watched any of these preachers on TV lately? They don't talk about that one, do they? I wonder why. I, people don't want to hear it, I guess. Is that what it is? You shouldn't have to change. Isn't it just faith? What? I don't know that they know what faith is then, right? You see, that's why I talk about it all the time. What is emunah? It's not mental assent, which is what they're implying when they go through this doctrine and they leave out repentance. They, they're implying that there's no change necessary. Now look, when you have... It, you're immediately into the kingdom, but there is a change, right? 
that is necessary in your life. You don't just do it however you want, do whatever you want. Part of the shua, you change, you change, right? Okay. Enough. You can see evidence of sanctification in the life of a person. Therefore, maybe we can answer these questions as well. Is that happening to all Jews? He's talking about his brothers, right? Is it? it he's, is that happening to all Jews? No. Are they all being no. consecrated, sanctified? No. Because we could see, right? What about uh, what about all believers or people who call themselves? We'll put it that way: people who call themselves believers. Is that happening? No. I won't ask what percentage you there. <laughs> could I could spark something, but I won't ask what percentage. But maybe it's something you might want to dwell on and think about. And what does that then say? And that one's rhetorical. <laughs> what does that say then? Right? What does it say? Think about it. If there is no change. But I, I will say this. You're not going to see instant change. When the promise was given to Abraham that he should have a, a, a son, Sarah, he didn't see that promise fulfilled in like the 25 years. So I'm more of the mind that. How does that deal with to doing Teshuva? You can repent, and, and yes, you can stop what you're doing, but that doesn't mean your way of thinking has changed. That doesn't mean. No, but, but Teshuva includes. Involved. Inclu and teshuva includes your way of thought as well. It's not just change so of action. That, that's it's change of teshuva is a life-changing thing. You don't just stop. You don't just stop with the action. You have to start to also continue in with your frame of thought and the emotional cause that calls you to go. Teshuva is an immediate change. It doesn't mean that you're perfect immediately, okay. but there is a change of mind and a change of course, a change in action, and you are to grow in that which is being set apart. Not that you have become perfect. You are being set apart. You are in this process. You are walking on a road, on a derech, the way, ha derech. You are on that road. The highway of holiness is the metaphor for it. Heading towards God, not going your own way on any derech of your own so anymore. Now, you may not know things, and you may be ignorant and going against. You may be addicted to things and need help in order to change certain things. Okay? But you should be actively trying, if that's the case, you should be actively trying to do so. Not ignoring faults that you do know about. Right? Right? Yeah, now, that doesn't, and it doesn't mean... But <laughs> I'm just saying, it sounds like to me to Like I said, it doesn't mean your life is perfect, and you will have difficulty, and your life maybe go up and down, and maybe way up and way down. But there should be a trend, an upward general trend. Let me show you. I've shown some people here, but maybe there's someone watching, right? Here's your graph. Right? Time. Okay, is that a straight line going up? It's not even close, is it? But is there a general trend going up? If I was to draw a median line here, where would it be? Oh, look at that. When you're somewhere on that line, you don't think you're doing very well, maybe. Especially not when you're down here. <laughs> right? But if you had the big picture, maybe you'd feel a little better.
It says in the Brit Hadashah, just like it says in the Torah, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. What does that mean? We have to know what that means. Right? Be pure. Follow his commands. Follow his ways. He's writing his Torah on your heart for a reason. Giving you a passion for it for a reason. Don't ignore it. Ah. So, we don't, we, so we don't see it in all people claiming to be believers in Yeshua. We don't see it in all Jews. Why don't we see it? This one I do want an answer for. Why don't we see that in all Jews? Why don't we see that in people claiming to be believers? Why do you think that is? There's no one right answer. Just throw, throw it out. It's fine. Why do we not see sanctification? Why don't we see the evidence? Why are they not changing? Oh, a lack of trust. So sort of hold themselves back, kind of reserve themselves, like, oh, should I really trust that much to actually change? Basically, they trust themselves and not realize that it's going to hurt them. Anymore. You know what? That's a separate thing. That's, I want, I'm in control. I, I trust you, whatever, whatever that means to them. But, I, but I'm keeping control here. Who's the Lord? Let me ask you a question. Who's the master then? Who's the Lord then? You think anyway. The of you when you do that. It's less stressful. There's no test there. Nothing has changed. They don't know what it means to be holy. There, there are two. There are two. The, okay, then I also yeah. have a question. Righteousness. There are different understandings of right it, within the scripture itself. You get a status of righteousness yeah. from Messiah because you can't be completely righteous. You can't make it. That's where you get from Messiah a righteousness, which is a a legal a legalese term. Um, meaning a status of righteousness even though you're not you're not righteous you have been declared righteous because he has taken your place and he is righteousness that's what scripture verses you hear you're taking his righteousness upon you that's in in some of the verses that's where you're seeing the term righteousness and that's the way you're being seeing it being used you're also seeing verses where his father Yosef was a tzaddik he was a righteous man. You see people in the Tanakh and the Torah that are called righteous because they, it's not that they were perfectly righteous, but they were righteous. Noah, for example, was righteous in his day compared to the other people in his day. He was righteous. You see, a tzaddik, he did, they did their best to follow God's ways. You understand? Because they had faith, yes. Because they had emunah. They were looking forward. They, maybe they were looking forward to a Mashiach someday who would take away, right? Uh, and their emunah caused them to do it. And their emunah, yeah, caused them to do it. That's exactly, we've been reading through Hebrews, right? Pros of Reos, chapter 11. I mean, that's, we're on chapter 2 in the study here. But we're, in our readings, we're in chapter 11. We're seeing all these people, all the things that they're doing in this heroes of faith. Heroes of Emunah, a, fa a belief that causes change, that, that causes um, action on your part. And all of them, you see action. And it says in front of each one, by faith, because, by, because of their faith, they did blank. By faith, Avram, blank. By faith, Avram's, or Moshe's parents, blank. No, uh, I have a question. Since we do the commandments, and by doing the commandments, we become sanctified through the commandments, 
but it's also written in First Corinthians through Christ, that Christ has become our sanctification and our holiness. So then how do we make sense out of that? Well, how would you, how, would you, how should a person make sense out of that? Yeah, well, he's like I was saying before, he is our, he gives us that status of righteousness. He is the one sanctifying us. He sent the Spirit to give you the, to empower you in order for you to follow the commandments. There's a partnership deal going on here. You got to yield. You can, he can graft you into the tree, for example, of Israel, and you could try to reject the grafting. What happens to you? You die. A branch that rejects the grafting dies. If you don't reject it, what happens? You get your life from the tree and nourishment from that Jewish tree. And the same is true with every... You know, when it was time for the exile to end, God said it would end in 70 years. But what did Daniel do? He prayed in the exile, confessing the sins of the people as if they're all his. And what happened? He prayed, God said, it happened. There's a partnership that we are allowed, we are privileged to work with God on a great number of things. And we're not just privileged to do it. We're called to do it. Called to do it. It's not a passive faith. Faith is something that produces action in your life. It produces change in your life. If it doesn't, if it's not happening, what does that say then? You need to you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself. But also, largely, why do we not see people who say they're believers and Jewish people, why don't we see them all being sanctified? Why don't we see them changing and becoming better and more pure and more holy and more righteous? Why don't we see them draw? Why? Uh, well, I think one of the reasons is that the Scripture commands us proper in all things and not going and show the regular path. So at times as believers, and I'm including myself for them being real, I've said at times, well Lord, I don't want your help in this area. When I've learned I need to get his help in the area where I don't want his help. So there's a struggle. There's a personal <coughs> struggle against what you know sometimes, right? Yeah. To some degree. So even those who maybe have faith, they struggle with the faith. Maybe some of them haven't really accepted the salvation yet. Maybe they haven't really done teshuva yet. They haven't really repented yet. And why? They don't want to give control. Yeah. I I would say um, 
these two. One, you are human, and you, you do have a sin nature, and when you accept Mashiach, your sin nature is not your right. You, you are called in my opinion to control it. Um, I would also say you are in a human body once again. That in the end, until you are removed from this flesh, you're always going to struggle with sin. Yeah, but what you guys are really describing for me, and that is that's true. Shaul talked about battling the spirit and the flesh. In Hebrew, you know, we hear Yetzer Hara, Yetzer Hatov, eagle inclination, good inclination, your battle, your whole life. We're at war. He talks about a spirit war. We are in war every day. But what you guys are describing is really this. What I'm talking about is people you don't see any change in. Then they are non-believers. And you brought up one is that maybe they haven't really accepted yet, which is what you're saying right now too and agreeing with over here. Um, but why are they not changing? Maybe because they're not even hearing that it's supposed to happen. <laughs> you want to actually guess who are supposed to what do you so think? With, uh, Hashima, hero Israel, we're commanded to keep hearing the word of God, literally. And it's been proven in psychology that the more you hear something, the more you're inclined to obey it. So that's actually a very good point. If no one's teaching repentance now, how do they expect people to do it? They can't. <laughs> If no one's teaching them to read their Bible now, how are they going to find out? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Right? And in that Word of God, they'll find out. But if they don't pick it up, and neither one's happening, then... It's kind of a different message that people are getting. It's, it's kind of a different message, right? It's say these words and believe that God exists and you will go to, to Wonderland when you die. It would be popular. That's the main thing. That's what you would see on the TV. Yeah, there are pockets. pockets. You're right. But, what, but where do they go from there? Then they say, but you could, that's why you can have Yeshua's righteousness. They don't say Yeshua, right? They, you have Yeshua's right, righteousness, and then you'll make it. And so I don't have to change or anything? You know, that's where the part... He tells them to change. I used to watch that Oh, we got a percentage now. <laughs> oh, that's people who fall away. I know, and then and then some would say they didn't fall away. They were never believers in the first place. Right? Either way. But Hebrews is tell, saying it, they fall away. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, they, so there's a the commandment so that people can learn. It's like, oh, that is a big problem. And I'm, you know, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of all these things. And some people give up, like the bear analogy I gave with the cornfield thing, right? Drop a little corn, uh, throw it all down, keep going back to the cornfield and never really make it, starve to death when winter comes. <laughs> right? That's not what we're called to. You grow. It's a process. You do what you know. And you study and you learn and you grow. And maybe you fall sometimes. But you come back. You stand back up again, and you move on, and you grow. Don't give up just because you fall. If we sin, right, and then we confess our sin, He is righteous and just. He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Did you have something? Was it you? I saw a hand somewhere, I thought. Maybe I ruined it. So. Okay. so, maybe their faith isn't real. Maybe, maybe they never really had faith. Maybe they've fallen. Maybe they had... You know, we have a parable about it, right? Yeah, the seeds. Yeah. There's a variety of reasons, because like the seeds. Maybe they had a little, but they didn't. It didn't get down there very deep. When trouble and strife comes in the, into their life, it chokes it up, chokes the seed, and it dies. Sometimes Stories like that. No discipling. They go that. They don't. They go. You know, maybe a congregation once a, one day a week, and then you know they don't read the Bible, maybe they're not Christian, and then they go to secular schools and get brainwashed. description of a great falling away, a description of a, the bride of Messiah that has made herself ready, that has been made pure. You know, there's a, uh, you, you know the bell curve? You know what I'm talking about? Really? When you, <laughs> uh, you, look at, you look at people's um, responses to things and you get answers and well, usually a bell, the bell curve for uh, religious, relig you know, people with religion would be in the past. There, there were very few that had like no real religion, you know, no really religion at all. I don't believe in God at all or something. And then there are not very many who are really radical, just really 100% dive in, you know, no restraints. I'm following God. Most people always fell in this middle area. The Bible talks about, and if you take a uh, history class in UNF, <laughs> uh, modern American history, you'll find that our bell curve has been turned upside down. Not many people are in the middle anymore. You're either, I don't believe there's a God anymore, maybe because you've been talked into it, or you are you see what's going on in the world and you are 100% sold out. And not too many are left in the middle anymore. Where are you? Bible talks about it was in a, we're talking about a class how people you know are 
see life and have reported it in polls in a history class. The Bible says that's how it's going to be in the end. No more sitting on the fence. No more lukewarm because you'll be spit out. There will be a great falling away. But those who hold fast and firm until the end, right? Read it. Read the first few chapters of Revelation, what the, what the people are inspired with by Yeshua, what he says to them. Hold on. And what else does he say? Clean up your act. I have a few things against you and you better clean it up. Or else, read them. So Yeshua is not ashamed to call those who are being sanctified his brothers. And in fact, he has called us that. Two twelve. When he says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. What is that? It's a quote from Psalm 22:23, where the Messiah says, and if you look up Psalm 22:23, where the Messiah says, I will proclaim your name to my kinsmen. Right there in the assembly, I will praise you. Did Yeshua do that? Not a trick question. He lived over 30 years on this earth. Did he praise God's name in the assembly, in the congregation? Yeah. yeah. He did it. They had Chavurim then, by the way, all over the, all over the Galil. That is small groups where people come together and study. They had synagogues, right, all over. And they had the temple. And guess what? The name was not lost. The, the name, the holy name of God, was not lost. In other words, there are pointers. Ancient Hebrew, the original Hebrew, had no pointers, no vowel sounds. The Hebrew in Yeshua's day had only a couple of vowel letters. Not all the vowel sounds were there. When the temple and, and the name of God was only used by then, at that point, because of theological teachings, which were flawed, it was only used one time a year by the Kohen Haggadol only, and only when he went into the holiest place of all, on Yom Kippur. When the temple fell, there was no longer any need. Why? To protect the name so no one will use it in vain. Well, it's not using it in vain to pray to him. But that was lost. You read in the scripture, you see the capital L-O-R-D or A-D, right? Adonai. You see the caps. That signifies that in the original, and if you look in the original, you'll see those four letters for the actual name of God. You'll see them in greetings. You'll see them in, in people making oaths. You see it all over in first-person speech. That means, I said, quote, and his name is in there. You see it all over. But you don't necessarily see it being taken in vain. Part of fencing was, well, let's not say it at all. This is absolutely necessary. Well, let's not just say it at all, ever. Except that one time a year, because that's when you get rid of everyone's sins. <laughs> right? All the sins. You know, have them not get away, rid of, but uh, have them covered for a year, rather. And, uh, and eventually, when the temple falls, well... Now what do we do? Now it's not spoken except in the synagogue and the name's not spoken there by the way. 
So over time, it's lost. What are the pointers? What are the vowels? What are they supposed to be? And you have big arguments, and now you have a, a sacred name movement, and people argue, and they all think that they all say that they're right. But if you look, there they don't agree with each other. Well, there's a reason for that. going to return with a new name which would be written on his thigh That's and we know where they will be it was written on his thigh. and we can call right now on his name and we can use names like Abba there are a lot of names of God we can still use Elyon, El Shaddai, Elohim there are a lot of names right anyway Yeshua knew that name. People used it in his day. He knew it and the people knew it. He proclaimed it in his worship. For years he taught in the synagogues and in the temple to those he called his brothers. He taught in the synagogues and in the temple to those he called his brothers. But he also worshipped and praised the Father in their very midst along with them. He was one of them. He is one of them. He is one of us. I wonder if when you read that verse, you remember that song from last week by Lamb. Anybody remember? I will talk to my brothers about God my Father. Together we'll sing His praises. I will talk to my brothers about God my Father. Together we'll sing His praises. Together we will sing his praises. Hallelujah. You remember? He's talking about the Messiah. It's from the Psalms. Yeshua talked to his brothers about God, his Father. And together they sang his praises. That was his pledge. In the Psalms, it was just a pledge. And he fulfilled it. That was the pet. More than that, it was the pattern of his life. It didn't matter who was around him. He worshipped. A pattern which was laid out for us to emulate. So the question is, will you do it? Will you talk to his brothers about God, your father? Will you talk to your brothers about God, your Father? So that together we can sing his praises. What would Yeshua do? Moving on. Last slide, by the way, in case you're tired. I will put my trust in him. And then it goes on. Here I am along with the children God has given me. The word is also is before that. Also, I will put my trust in him. And then it goes on. Here I am along with the children God has given me. These are things that the Messiah, he's, he's saying, the writer of Hebrews is saying, these are things Messiah said. He said, I will put my trust in him. And it goes on, here I am along with the children God has given me. The point is, the Messiah, as a model for us, as one of us, put his trust in the Father. <laughs> he died believing he would be resurrected. He put his trust in the Father. He didn't want to die. Father, can you tuck this cup away, please? But if not, but if not, he had anxiety... He bled, he, he sweat blood. He had anxiety about it, but he managed the anxiety and he worked through it anyway. And he said, it would be nice if you could take this cup away, 
But if not, thy will be done. He managed it. And he moved on. What's God calling you to do? What are you facing? You might be anxious about it. You might be struggling. That's human. It's understandable. We need to manage it and move on. Yeshua, the Messiah, model for us. He put his trust in the Father, so his teaching, so, therefore, his teachings produced fruit. He had spiritual children. Who are they? There's one. <laughs> You're in this room. You're in this room. Somebody asked, not too long ago, about the passage in Isaiah where he's called everlasting, you know, would be an everlasting father. A son is given to us, and you know, government shall be on his shoulders and all these things, and one of his names is everlasting father. How's that? You're his spiritual children. You're also his brother. Sister. So he put his trust in the Father, so his teachings produced fruit. If you have trust in the Father, your teachings will produce fruit. What kind of fruit? Maybe that's for another day. There are a lot of different, we could teach on fruit for a while, right? So, but one of the fruit is people, right? You are his children. However, to understand this better, we should look at the context a little closer, he read. Right? This is another quote which comes from Isaiah 8, 17 and 18 and is attributed to the Messiah, but in the Greek, but the Greek in Hebrews is missing some important pieces. Remember, to quote part of a passage is to quote the whole passage. So that missing information is important. It's also important to notice what's missing, right? And who his audience is. But look at he the Hebrews text and listen. As I read the verses in Isaiah, look at the Hebrews text, meaning not the Hebrew, the Hebrews text uh, in the book of Hebrews. And listen as I read the verses in Isaiah to see if you can find the variances. Okay? And that Hebrew, the Hebrews, of course, Hebrews 2.13. You ready? Everybody watching? Hebrews 2.13? Okay, and I'm reading Isaiah 8.17. I will wait for Adonai. I will wait for Adonai, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. Yes, I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Adonai has given me will become for Israel signs and wonders from Adonai Tzavaot, living, living on Mount Zion. Did you see it? I will wait for Adonai who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. Yes, I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Adonai has given me will become for Israel signs and wonders from Adonai Tzavaot living on Mount Zion. What's missing? What's changed? I will wait for Adonai. Yeah, so there's a change. But in context, this kind of means the same thing. I will wait for him who is hiding his face from Jacob. I will look for him. Behold, I and the children... You see, in context, it kind of means the same, but the Greek is different. The Greek does say, I'll put my trust in him. And in Hebrew, I will wait for him who is hiding his face in the house, from the house of Jacob. Why is he waiting for him? Because he trusts him. I will look for him. 
behold, okay, the Messiah who would trust in Adonai and they would look for him who was hiding his face from Jacob, that Messiah would bear fruit or followers who would be signs from Adonai, the God of armies, to the rest of Israel. Those followers were described as children who lived on Mount Zion. They were fellow Jews. In other words, they were his brothers. And that reminds me of Shavuot when the Ruach HaKodesh fell on the remnant as they sat in the house, which is the temple, and they began to speak in tongues to the Jewish pilgrims who would come there from all over the world. That day, the ones who had been consecrated truly became signs to all of Israel. I will take that principle further. All believers are signs to the Jewish people. All of us true believers have a job to do and that is to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. Our lives should be such an example of righteousness and peace and obedience to Yah that they would long to have what we have. That they would long to have what you have. And that they would seek that out, maybe through you. If they see that, they'll seek it out. And how will they seek it out if they're seeing it in you? They'll seek it out through you. Do you see the window of opportunity? And how it comes about? Have you ever thought of yourself as a sign and a wonder to the Jewish people? Well, if you're being sanctified, then you are just that, a sign whether you're a natural branch or a wild branch grafted into the tree of Israel, the tree of faith, you have a purpose. You are called to bear fruit to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Your life is a sign to them all of what life can look like if one follows the Messiah, the King of Israel, and the God of Israel. So take that's a responsibility, right? It's a heavy responsibility. So take this responsibility seriously. People's souls depend on it. Take it seriously. You are an ambassador of the Messiah. Is that not scripture? So talk to your brothers about God your Father. And maybe you'll find that together you'll sing his praises. Wouldn't that be great? Think about that. Think, get past the work part. Don't worry about the work part. Don't worry about the be, you know, maybe the pick on you thing. Don't worry about the maybe you'll be persecuted thing. Put all of that part out of your head and picture a future date. This is the goal. Picture a future date where those people who you're praying about, who you're thinking about, who you'd like to believe and be sitting next to you or be with you in the kingdom. Imagine that they are there with you right now, praising Yah with you right now. Imagine it, picture it. Because that's the goal. When you want to make it, when you want, when you want something to happen, you've got to set goals. You have to know where you're going, right? And then you set other goals to get there. You got to know what it is you want. You got to go after in order to go after it. You've got to be able to picture it. See it. And then make it happen. Don't worry about the work first. Picture it first. Envision it. Envision it. Wow, 530? Okay, I was going to maybe go further, but I'm going to stop here. Father, fill us with appreciation and with zeal for your word. And for your calling and purpose in our lives. Help us to follow you with all of our hearts, minds, souls, and strength. Help us to lift Yeshua the Messiah high in all that we do. To lead people to him. And bring you glory. In his holy name. In the name of Yeshua. Amen.